Just curious, how many of you in the room have spent time learning with my calendar, either over Zoom or in Israel? Okay, Alan Rotten was the first one to turn around, right? You got all around. Okay. And I'm sure there are more in line. Now he cries, and we'll get him to speak while he's crying. We are really thrilled to welcome Mike here to North Shore Congregation Israel, though he is known to many of us. Mike grew up in Canada and made Aliyah in 1988. He spent most of his adult life as an informal educator, guiding and teaching in Israel and Europe, and these days online as well. He's a proud parent of three adult children and is a grandparent, so he'll tell you about his almost four-month-old grandson if you even hint at that. And Mike, uh, while well, Israel is his home, he refers to, his, to Glencoe as his home in the United States. So welcome home. We're glad you're here. I'm honored to be a Mazel Tov to the bride and groom. Now I realize why there's so many people here, but Mazel Tov. Um, can you hear me? Is it up high enough? You can hear me back there? Good. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Um, it's wonderful to be here, particularly when the weather is so nice. But I come from Israel, and I last week uh, celebrated Shabbat in a very different place than this. Uh, and I'm really glad to be here, not just because I'm amongst friends and family, but because the, and the weather is nice. But last week, the Kabbalah Shabbat that I participated in was in Budapest. And I understand Rabbi Lisa a lot better than I understand the Hungarian rabbi just last week. But it is truly incredible, I mean, living in Israel and, and doing, as, as Rabbi Lisa said, the things that I do, to be able to go to places like Budapest and know that there are people doing the exact same thing seven hours ahead, mind you, um, with a little bit of a different accent. So Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Um, last week in the Parsha, Parshat Kedoshim, we read that we are supposed to be holy, right? The commandment is, God says, Ani Adonai Alechem, I am your God. Um, thus God speaks to the people of Israel, and he says to them, you shall be holy because I am holy. And most of us spend most of our life grappling with what it means to be holy. It's not an easy thing. Um, and as we go through different stages in our life, and now as a grandparent, you said, if you ask me about my grandchild, I will. He's almost four months old. He lives in Tel Aviv. He's the cutest thing ever. But we all say that about our first grandchildren. But what does it mean to be holy? All right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a question. For thousands of years and hundreds of languages, we've been asking that question. This week, however, we give a bit of, or we're, we're given a bit of a recipe on how to actually be holy. And this week's parsha, where God tells us a number of things, that's why he tells Moses to tell us. He tells Moses in the parsha, Lemur, he says, these are my dates, these are my times. Speak to the people and say to them, these are the fixed times, the Moadim, the fixed times of God, which you shall proclaim as sacred occasions. So we've got a clue. How do you be holy? There's certain times in the year where you have to be more godlike. And then there's a whole calendar, in case you're not sure, in case you're online doesn't tell you what the Jewish holiday is coming up. And by the way, they're always on time. So don't tell me that the holidays are late this year. They're always the exact same time. It's just that we live in a reality where the time is a little bit different. So what are the holidays? It starts with Shabbat and then goes through the entire cycle. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and, and uh, what's after that? And Sukkot and then doesn't talk about Hanukkah. And then it goes later on into, into, uh, into Pesach. And then it goes after that seven weeks later into Shavuot and it doesn't talk about Purim in there. These are the biblically sanctioned sacred times, right? Where we become holy. And what's amazing is that Judaism, in many ways, is a community, is a faith, is a tradition, is a people that sanctifies time. You think that space is holy, and it is, but time is more holy than anything else. And as your rabbis and cantors and Jewish educators will know, one of the greatest 20th century minds of Judaism, Avram Heschel, taught us that that is what we do. And I quote Heschel. Judaism is a religion of time aiming to sanctify time. We are taught to be attached to holiness in time, to be attached to sacred events, whether it's weddings or holidays, to learn how to consecrate sanctuaries that emerge from the magnificent stream of the year. Jewish ritual may be characterized as the art of significant form in time, as architecture in time. And every time I come here, by the way, I'm blown away by the architecture. One of these days, there are enough people that I can actually be in the main sanctuary, but you're in a beautiful sanctuary. But that's secondary, right? That's secondary to Shabbat, and that's secondary to Sukkot and Shavuot and all the other days of the year. The main theme of faith relies in the realm of time, and that's why you're here. 
when you're here to celebrate the imminent wedding, you're here to celebrate the women of North Shore Congregation Israel, this is the place you come together at a particular time. So as I said, seven hours later in Budapest. But it's not just Eshel. Another one of my great uh, teachers, mentors, Avra, uh, uh, Yossi, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi wrote in his amazing book about Zachor, he says that what we try to do in Judaism is we try to fuse the past and the present toward the future, of course, and memory isn't re merely remembering, recollecting, but rather is in reactualizing. Last month, we had the Seder. The reason I actually moved to Israel, you can tell by my funny Canadian accent, I'm not originally Israeli, is because I was tired of having two seders. In Israel, we have one seder, and it's much easier because it's just, it's a long event. But what do we say in the seder? Every generation should look upon itself as if they came out of Egypt, and what we try to do is recreate a sense of slavery. How? By prolonging the meal for four or five hours. Anyway, but all, all joking aside, we... We, we construct memory in time, but the state of Israel has done something beyond just constructing memory in time. We have reactualized both time and space on two levels. In time, there is a 10 day period, similar to, different from, complementary to the 10 days of the high holidays from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur. And those are the 10 days that just ended this week. How many of you were there? I know Rabbi Lisa was on Tuesday night, was it? where we heard Achino Amnini at uh, Am Shalom, just around the corner. And what we do is from one day, what is called, most of you know, Yom HaShoah, but it's not really called Yom HaShoah, the day of Holocaust. It's called Yom HaZikaron, Remembrance Day Memorial Day, Shoah for Holocaust, Ulugvura and Heroism. That began 10 days ago. And then we, and there was an argument as to when that date should be, by the way, the founding fathers and mothers in the early years of Israel had to figure out when, when is it? There's another Holocaust day. You're probably familiar with January 27th. This isn't Jewish trivia. January 27th is International Holocaust Day. And why is that January 27th? Because that's the day that Auschwitz was liberated by the Soviet Red Army. But we as Jews chose a time different than that. We chose a time connected to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that we commemorate not just the murder of six million, but the heroism and the resistance in all those years of people struggling and trying to survive. And then we have a date that's fixed in time. It's the Hay of ER, the 5th of ER, which was the 14th of May, 1948. That's Independence Day. So the founding fathers and mothers created this 10-day period, sacred time, in order to commemorate what happens when you don't have a Jewish state, Shoah, possibly, and the celebration of a state. And the celebration of the state today, like July 4th, it's a no-brainer, as we say in biblical Hebrew. If the independence was declared on the 5th of ER, that's the date of Independence Day. But before Independence Day, they created another day, Yom Zikaron. We just had a Yom Zikaron, a day of memory. But this one is of fallen Israeli soldiers and victims of terror. It wasn't always victims of terror. 20 years ago, it was added because there were so many victims of terror. Civilians were killed by terrorists. Unfortunately, since last year, there are now 1,600 more people who have been added to that list. Almost 1,300, about 1,300 people killed on October 7th, and another, as of two hours ago, 278 soldiers who have been killed in the land operation in Gaza. So there is this 10-day period in Israel that is a, on the one hand, somber, solemn, reflective, difficult period, but on the other hand, it kind of descends down and then crescendos up in this literally hour or so ceremony on Mount Herzl, where we realize that the price that all those people paid in sacrificing their lives ultimately allows us to be sovereign in our own land and we celebrate Independence Day. This year was the most difficult of 76 years we've ever had that period, why? because of what happened on and since October 7th. So I have three children, as Rabbi Lisa mentioned, 31, that's, uh, actually I shouldn't say he's my son, he's the father of my grandson, formerly known as my son. But he and his wife live in Tel Aviv and we have a 28 year old daughter and her husband, they live up in the north, well, less north now than October 6th, October 7th. And I have a young son who's 26 tomorrow and he's, um, uh, he's did a lot of time in reserve duty, about six months in reserve duty. So I'm here. They're there, I was in Budapest for part of the time, and I said, so what are you doing for Memorial Day? So I call my son, 
And I said, what are you doing this year for uh, Memorial Day? And I knew what his answer was going to be. He went to his unit, and they had a memorial service for the five soldiers in his unit that had fallen since October 7th. To put it in context, eight soldiers in his unit fell from 1973 until 2023, and five fell on, on, on or after October 7th. And then the next day, he went to a ceremony at, a, uh, at the cemetery of the guy who was his commander, a major in his small little unit in basic training, who also fell in combat shortly after October 7th. And I said, so uh, how was it, assuming he's going to say how difficult it was? And he said, it was okay. And I was a bit surprised, but I didn't want to push him. And uh, I said, okay. He said, yeah, but y every day since October 7th has pretty much been the same thing. And that's a sentiment across Israel. So yes, obviously, the day of wh where, we, where we commemorate and sanctify time by reflecting on those who lost their lives has greater significance, but that is the sense of where we are in Israel. And then I spoke to my daughter, women, of course, have two boys and, and a girl, and they, have, uh, they, they speak their wisdom more. My boys just act their wisdom more than my daughter does. And I said, so what are you doing for Independence Day? And she said, well, that's a good question, because we weren't sure what to do. Generally, what do Israelis do? They go and they into their town, and there's the biggest musicians in the country come, and they play concerts, and there are fireworks, and people are dancing, and kids are out until 4 in the morning. It's, there's a reason to celebrate. We have a sovereign, independent state. But this year, a lot of people felt it was very difficult to do that. And she said that she and her husband um, went down to Tel Aviv, joined well, my son, formerly known as my son, now the father of my grandson, and my daughter-in-law, formerly, you get it. But they went out to a rally in Hostage Square. How many of you have been to Israel, by the way, since October 7th? Since October 7th? Okay. Rabbis, that's a, a request to all of you to come join us. Um, I, I can tell you as an Israeli, who've had the privilege of hosting a number of people, not enough from outside of Israel since October 7th. It is unbelievably strengthening to every single person you meet, from the barista at the hotel making your coffee in the morning, to the people on the street, to the people who are wounded who you visit in the hospital. So come. And she said, we didn't feel like celebrating, so we went instead to Hostage Square. There were 100,000 people, and there um, they were grappling with how do you celebrate independence and sovereignty when 132 people, um, now unfortunately 129 because three bodies of people who were killed on October 7th were brought back to Israel in some crazy operation yesterday. How do you celebrate in that reality? And so people being together and strengthening each other. And then she said to me that, you know, I looked at the person next to me, a total stranger, but I knew that we're connected by no more than one or no more than two people. And unfortunately, two of the five of the, s of the eight of the last soldiers, the three of them actually, are from my town of Modin, a small little town of about 100,000 people. So I hope that next year at this time, in this 10-day period, that we sanctify because we remember what happened in the Shoah, we remember the cost and the continued cost of having Israeli sovereignty, um, and I hope that we're able to celebrate a little bit better next year. Where do we go with all of this? Look, I know that this, and when Rabbi Lisa said, uh, I said, I'm coming, she says, great, uh, but it's the women of Norwood, the women's, women of NSCI weekend. So, you know, try to relate somehow to, to women. Um, and of course I am, because you're at least half of the crowd. So I thought to myself, okay, war, uh, a lot of times we only think about men, and unfortunately it's mostly men in the war cabinet and not women in the war cabinet. If there were women in the war cabinet, we'd probably be in a different situation. But one of, I discovered mine and Rabbi Wendy's um, sources of inspiration is the late Rabbi Lord, uh, Chief Rabbi of England and the Commonwealth, Jonathan Sachs. Um, and he writes in his Haggadah, I didn't look at your bookshelf, Rabbi Lisa, but I can afterwards, but probably Rabbi Lisa as well. He talks about the role at Pas in, in Pesach of the father in the family. Um, and he says that the idea of what we try to do at Pesach is to inculcate a sense of memory, right? The days in this period are days of memory. That's what makes them holy because we remember what happened to us. So he says that memory is primarily the responsibility of socialization from the father. And in fact, the very word memory in Hebrew, zachar, or zachor, comes from the name, the word male, zachar in Hebrew. But then, of course, you know, he used to grapple with, okay, there, at least in the traditional family that he's writing about, there is a mother as well. There's a biological person who gives birth to the child. And he says that the compassion, the sense of rachmanut or rachmonis in Yiddish comes from the Hebrew word rechen, which is the womb. And so for us to raise our children, we need to have both a 
present figure who is able to tell the story and remember the story to connect the children to the past and to build the future, but also the mother who has the compassion. And I thought of a, a number of women who, unlike any other war operation in Israeli history, have played a significant role. And if you haven't heard about them, go research them afterwards. There's the story of a group of four women in a tank. Yes, Israeli women are in tanks. Ha weren't five years ago, but they are now. And they basically single-handedly killed dozens of terrorists and saved a kibbutz next to Gaza. The story of, and I wrote her name down so I won't forget it, Inbal Lieberman, a young 25, I think she's 26, now year old woman, who when she heard the sirens going off in her kibbutz near Ram, opposite the town of Sderot, called or texted the other members, the first responders in the community, and they killed dozens of terrorists and closed the gates and made sure that they didn't get into that particular community. Or a woman named Nitzan Mintz, who you've never heard of, and you probably won't hear, but Google her name, because Nitzan Mintz is an artist. She's a street artist. If you've been to Tel Aviv, and some of you have with me, you might have seen some street art. And she does beautiful poetry. She met another street artist who does all sorts of art with Band-Aids. Now you guys know what I'm talking about. Deddy. They're married. They happen to be in New York on October 7th. And they decided very quickly that they're going to put up these hostage, missing hostage posters. You've seen them, I'm sure, right? They're all over the place. That's their initiative, Nitsan Mintz. And she has a beautiful installation inside Hostage Square as well, where she references the biblical prophecy of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah says, you know, for Rachel, and Rachel is crying over her sons, and then at the end of the prophecy, and we shall return, the, the children shall return to the land. And then she doesn't just leave it at that, but she uses white in Hebrew to quote the Bible, and then she fills it in with color, and she describes, uh, and then she writes not just the sons, but the daughters, and the mothers, and the grandparents, and the grandchildren, and the son-in-laws, and everything else. So, Nitzan Mitz and her art. Then there's the story, of course, of the Iron Dome, which has saved countless lives. Any baseball fans in here, the crowd? You know if you hit 400, you're in the Hall of Fame. If you hit 950, right, that's what the Iron Dome does. 95 out of 100 times, but not 100 times, it knocks a rocket out of the sky and saves people. And most of the people who do that are people who are young women, about 18 to 20 years old, who literally sit in the room and press a button when the radar tells them that it's going to land on a populated area. People you've never heard of, but have saved thousands and thousands of lives. My son, the reserve soldier, is a, in a search and rescue unit, and, and not so much with him, but in many of the other units, uh, a lot of doctors, a lot of paramedics, and a lot of medics are women. And I understand you're actually going to be meeting a, you have an opportunity if you come at 7 o'clock on Monday night here or in the sanctuary, wherever, here, there, um, to meet a wounded female Israeli soldier. And unlike any other military operation war we've ever had, women have been very involved um, on so many levels. And tragically, many women, of course, were killed, civilians, grandmothers, and young women at the concert. The last woman um, I, I, I will talk about, and many of us are wearing these dog tags with the yellow ribbon to bring um, bring our people home, is Rachel Poland Goldberg, who comes from this neck of the woods and is definitely the face, uh, internationally at least, of those family members of those people who um, still have members of family who are missing in action. Um, I come to you uh, from Israel. I'm going back to Israel on Monday, um, and I will tell you that the people of Israel, although we in a different way here and there reflect on that sanctity of time in that 10-day period, I know that we are very much strengthened by the fact that even though we might be in a physically different space, um, we're definitely in the same mindset. So Shabbat Shalom to all of you and Mazal Tov. And hopefully the next time I come and speak, it'll be a little bit more uplifting. So Shabbat Shalom. Mike, thank you so much for sharing reflections on sacred time. For those of us who have been in Israel for Yom HaZikaron and the transition from Yom HaZikaron, this ultimate day of somber reflection with moments of silence when the whole country stops into Yom HaAzma'ut, a celebration, it is sacred time like none other. And thank you for sharing stories of some of the women among the soldiers fighting and protecting. 